So before a destructive event such as what is being called a mud flood, but also earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and the sort, much of which happened in the 1700s and early to mid 1800s, including one event in the late 1800s that we'll talk about. Um, there was a period of a hundred years where the earth, we don't know what's really happening, but we know what we heard. Frequency discharges as if cannon fire is common. Could it be fascists that do it? Leftover weaponry from ages gone by. It's antiquitech. It's the um, type of thing that you see all the time but don't know what it is. The pipes. The pipes are calling. But what does it mean? Well, uh, Martin Liedke, Flat Earth British, was the first uh, that I heard talk about this, and he is the one who um, speculated about the actual use of these as devices of meaning and value, which would make a lot more sense than the symbolic. Symbolic is just the crap that we're fed today. Like the sergeant of arms or sergeant at arms in the U.S. House of Representatives has a mace. It's not the original mace. It's the third mace. The original mace is gone in 1812, um, destroyed by a, the fire, they say. But it would make more sense that the mace was an actual weapon of such that any dignitary, anybody in that room would be fearful of the one who wields the mace. That makes sense, doesn't it? It's like the scepter of a king. Uh, the king is going to hold the scepter, right? The scepter is going to be an actual weapon. It's like, would he, would he hold a rubber AK-47? What kind of song or tune do the pipes play? It may be one of destruction. And when it's time to pay the piper, the price might be much more costly than anyone realizes. So now we're going to listen to Mud Flood. Um, Mr. Flood, you can call him Mud if you get to know him better. Taking little snippets from his discussion about a book by Humboldt and what well, you'll hear. The little town of Honda on the banks of the Magdalena is not less than 145 leagues from Cotopahi. And yet, in the great explosions of this volcano in 1744, a subterraneous noise was heard at Honda and supposed to be discharges of heavy artillery. The monks of St. Francis spread the news that the town of Carthagena was besieged and bombarded by the English, and the intelligence was believed throughout the country. I looked at the newspaper that was coming out of Caracas at the time of 1812 and around there. And it was actually a strange story because it was two British guys from Trinidad who were operating a newspaper in Caracas. That's a strange story in itself. That's not mentioned in the Humboldt book. I think I found that on Wikipedia. He claims that he was able to find and be provided with eyewitness accounts, although that's not entirely clear. But Humboldt has enough information to speak on the earthquakes on the very first page. Humboldt is lamenting over friends he had lost that he originally remembered from his first time he traveled to Venezuela. He doesn't explicitly say who his friends are. He's saying that now everything in Venezuela is in ruins and the, the surface of the soil has changed. Of course, I'm wondering whether this means sand fissures or mud flooding. The Wikipedia article, having looked this up, mentions dirty water. Is that mud flooding? I don't know. Generally, the first page, Humboldt is saying that the whole city of Caracas has disappeared, but people are now rebuilding on the ruins, that the revolutions are not correctly recorded in history. So he's talking about the revolutions that happened in Caracas. These are described with the least accuracy when they happen to coincide with period of civil dissensions. Earthquakes and the eruptions of volcanoes strike the imagination by the evils which are the necessary consequence. Humboldt has reliable information from friends about the Caracas earthquake. I have thought proper to record in this work all I have been able to collect 
with certainty respecting the earthquakes of the 26th of March, 1812, which destroyed the town of Caracas. From the beginning of 1811 till 1813, a vast extent of the earth, limited by the meridian of the Azores, the valley of the Ohio, the cordilleras of New Grenada, the coasts of Venezuela, and the volcanoes of the smaller West India Islands, has been shaken almost at the same time by commotions which may be attributed to subterraneous fires. Humboldt describes the shocks that happened on March 26, 1812, at 4.07 in the afternoon, and that the shocks were felt and church bells rang. He also says nine or ten thousand people in Caracas were killed. Here I recite a poem for thee, simply to break the monotony. Here lies the body of Miss Mary McGee. She died at the age of a hundred and three. For fourteen years she kept her virginity. Not a bad record for this vicinity. We learn that nine-tenths of Caracas is destroyed and the effects are less in the raven of Cavaguata or Caraguata and there a cathedral remains standing. And if there was any clues in Humboldt's work that these earthquakes were something other than a natural catastrophe where Humboldt uses some strange language and compares the earthquakes to artillery and musketry. While violent commotions were felt at the same time in the valley of the Mississippi, in the island of St. Vincent, and in the provinces of Venezuela, the inhabitants of Caracas, of Calabozo, situate in the midst of the steppes and on the borders of the Rio Apura, in a space of 4,000 square leagues, were terrified on the 30th of April, 1812, by a subterraneous noise which resembled frequent discharges of the largest cannon. The noise began at two in the morning. It was accompanied by no shock, which is very remarkable. It was as loud on the coast as at 80 leagues distance inland. This noise, which happened in April, which is actually a month after the Caracas earthquake, is actually talking about the volcano of St. Vincent. On the 30th, the lava passed the brink of the crater and after a course of four hours reached the sea. The noise of the explosion resembled that of alternate discharges of very large cannon and of musketry. And, which is well worthy of remark, it seemed much louder at sea, at a great distance from the island, than in sight of land, and near the burning volcano. It was everywhere believed, this is the noise in April, it was everywhere believed to be transmitted through the air, and was so far from being thought a subterraneous noise that at Caracas as well as at Calabozo, preparations were made to put the place into a state of defense against an enemy who seemed to be advancing with heavy artillery. Mr. Palacio, crossing the Rio Apura, below the Oravante, near the junction of the Rio Nula, was told by the inhabitants that the firing of cannon had been heard as distinctly at the western extremity of the province of Varinas as at the port of La Guaira to the north of the chain of the coast. Okay, the following clips come from a TV show called One Step Beyond, and the episode in particular is one from the public domain collections. So it's used with that in mind. What you're about to see is a matter of human record. You may believe it or not. Real people who lived this story, they believe it. They know. These zigzagging lines, for those who can interpret such charts or graphs, indicate four violent disturbances somewhere on the face of this earth. Now, such a seismographic chart 
isn't usually found in a newspaper editor's office. But this isn't a day for the usual. The night editor of this paper, the Boston Star, is named Henry Soames. He's a lonely man, quiet and ambitious. And yet during the next 16 hours, Soames will make newspaper history. For what will happen in the quiet of his office between 5.30 and 6.30 on this August morning of 1883, Soames will never understand. No, will anyone. Anyway. Mr. Kinsman. Yeah, what is it, Jake? We've got a really hot one here. Huh? So where did you get this? Just came in from Soames. Man, I'll say it's hot. You already put the paper to bed, didn't we? Yeah, but it's your decision. We can't go on the streets without this. Every newspaper in the country will be carrying it. Hold the edition. Print it. All right. Tell Tony to hold the front page, all right? Heading and sub, heading across six. Hello, would you please get me Set it in Great Primer. We haven't used that since the Civil War. Yes, no, Mr. Sir. Kinsman, senior. He edits the paper, remember? Mr. Kinsman. And hurry. Nobody got it. Nobody else got the story. Sure. The whole of Boston is reading the Star. We can't sell enough papers. And you, Soames, Henry, you were the only night editor in the East who picked it up. Oh, sure, they'll be running it in Frisco and L.A., but as far as we've checked, nobody this side of Chicago, but nobody. You want to look at the headline, huh? Jake did a great job, you know. Oh, go on, look at it. Repertoire. An island in the Dutch East Indies was destroyed by a volcanic eruption late yesterday afternoon. Four gigantic explosions blasted the island and... Crack up, tell her. That's a name nobody will ever forget. The biggest explosion of all time. A mountain blown ten miles into the air. Huh. A dust cloud covering half the Indian Ocean. Say, don't you have some whiskey or something we could celebrate with? And the way you wrote it up. I, I wrote it up? Uh, sure. That was a great bit of journalism, Henry. Oh, by the way, Dad wants to see you over at the office straight away. Straight away. You can sleep for a week after this. Man, you wrote yourself a page of history. Holmes, congratulations. That was a wonderful job you did. Wonderful. There's only one thing bothers me. How are we going to keep you? That is, unless the paper could use another editor. What did you do with the original copy? I've been looking all over for it. I don't know anything about the copy. But it came from the wire room, didn't it? No. Well, at least I, I don't think it did. Well, then, just where did you get the story? I didn't get it, Mr. Kinsman. Oh, Soames! I'm telling you the truth. I don't know anything about the story. I've never heard of Krakatoa. A volcano? It's crazy. The whole thing's absolutely crazy. What on earth are you talking about? Here it is, right on the front page, with your byline. Would you please listen to me? I didn't write that story. I couldn't have. And perhaps you'd like to tell us who did. 
a matter of fact, I don't remember much about what happened last night. I was feeling pretty terrible. I handle a lot of routine stuff. And about 5.30, I heard the explosions. Four great explosions. We just heard from the wire room. Yeah? It's very strange. Half past nine and there's, there's no follow-up to the story. 36,000 people get blown off the face of the earth and no follow-up. Did you check the wire services? They're checking with us, for heaven's sake. So is New York, Philadelphia and Washington. It's like a madhouse out there. Nobody heard of Krakatoa until the star came on the streets this morning. The story wasn't transmitted by any of the telegraph services. They say it was the quietest night for months. Say you heard four explosions? Yes. Ten, fifteen thousand miles away in the Dutch East Indies? They're in my head. I don't know. Whole buildings seemed to shake and then everything went blank just now. Four gigantic explosions blasted the island and its 2,600 foot mountain off the face of the globe. Are you sure? All right. None of the West Coast papers is carrying the story either. Nobody but us. Kill the story. Get out of everyone you can. Kill it. I want you out of this building in five minutes. You'll never work on another paper as long as you live. Who is it? It's me. They're talking about you downstairs. They said you've gone local. you go gone away because of what people are saying. Oh, no, Danny, I've... I've been in Boston a long time. Oh, writer's got to move around, learn how the world lives. Yes, that's what I'd like to do. Can I have just one more look at that book? The one with the ships in it. Sure can. Here, uh, you can keep it. Really? Sure. And all the other things I leave behind that I haven't got room for. Thanks, Mr. Soane. I talked to a man down at the harbor the other day. He took me aboard the brig. Now, you know what I told you about talking to people down there? You keep away from that waterfront, do you hear? Oh, uh, this guy was all right. He showed me the compass. It was just like he told me. The true law and the magnetic law. He said there were lots of places in the world that hadn't been discovered yet. Yeah. There's a whole lot we don't know about, Danny. Yeah, I guess. Where's Krakatoa? Can I look for it on the atlas? Java and, what was it? Sumatra? No, Dan. Yes, the Sun No. Here it is, Krakatoa. Oh, it couldn't have happened. Whole island blown up the face of the earth. It just couldn't have happened. Danny. Danny, I'm not a great reporter, I'm a fake. Danny, I did a terrible thing today. I wrote that story. Sure, I wrote that story, but it's not true. None of it. Our seismograph picked up these shock waves late yesterday afternoon, Mr. Kinsman. They're very weak. Yeah, but they could have come from the neighborhood of the Dutch East Indies. If you look, Frank, you'll see there are four distinct and distant shocks. Subterranean explosions of the most colossal force. We were trying to figure it out when I picked up your newspaper an hour ago. And I'm still trying to figure it out. 
The eruption you describe here fits exactly with the characteristics of the wave motion we've recorded. In fact, this kind of upheaval is about the only thing that would explain such a wave pattern. From a scientific point of view, your report would seem to be absolutely accurate. Reads like a piece of first-hand observation, an eyewitness account. The eruption took place late yesterday afternoon. The epicenter is 13,000 miles from here. So before I go completely out of my mind, perhaps one of you gentlemen will kind of explain how you got this information. I don't know that there's very much I can say, except that we would appear to be fortunate, I think extremely fortunate, in having on our staff an exceptionally gifted night news editor. Hey, hey, Please get those people out of the building. You know I can't stand it. Bear with it, my friend. They're all readers of the Star. Brand new readers. Say, have you caught the noon edition? Psalms before medical experts. Miracle man of journalism visits Washington. How does it feel to be famous? Famous, Henry. You've got a very nice office here. Very nice. Oh, by the way, don't forget that lecture tonight at 8.30 at the National Institute. What am I going to say? Oh, you know, the usual. Uh, how I did it. He thinks you're a man. Hello, Henry. Is the column ready for tomorrow? for miracles, for some signs from the sky. We all want to believe they're better than they seem. Am I afraid? The biggest shareholder on the stock market is small and afraid before the enormity of chance. Back at door of the stock market. A dust cloud that rises eight miles high, that covers 400 square miles, that covers all men with a dread of some ultimate calamity. Tears, prophecies, for consolation, for the extra buck. No. There's no short or easy answer. We can blow ourselves to kingdom come. Or we can receive weird, incredible visions. We carry the wonder of ourselves in us. As we carry our own mortality. This line. Stumbling instrument. There's a man. There, how's that sound? Don't you understand? I didn't do anything, something happened to me. I'm not a god or a prophet, I'm a very ordinary reporter. I'm going to stop being your carnival freak. I'm not my husband. Mr. Thorne. Mr. Thorne, I knew you'd come to help me. Where's Danny? Where's my boy? Danny, he went off this morning and didn't come back. The police have been searching for him all afternoon. You know that boy in ships. That's where he is. On a ship. You were his friend. He loved you. You were like a father to him. You'll be all right, I'm sure of it. You went on some ship. What one? Tell me, what one? You're different from us. You can see things. Tell us, where's Danny? I don't know. I don't know. So what did you come back here for? What good are you if you can't find Danny? He done it before. Go on. Do whatever you do.
This is the one part of Soames' story which cannot be verified. Did he return to Boston and in the news editor's room predict the assassination of President McKinley? This is legend. But the rest is not. Soames did indeed, in a Boston newspaper, report the explosion of Krakatoa 12 hours after it happened, which was many hours before news could have reached the American continent by any human agency. What was so? A prophet? A freak of nature? Or just an ordinary man who by some big coincidence performed for that which is inexplicable?